Welcome to the Reconciliation Conversation. We want this podcast to be a space where we can expose hate, encourage love, equip for healthy reconciliation, and emphasize unity so that all people can know their value together as one. Well, welcome to another edition of the Reconciliation Conversation. As always, my name is Derek, and I'm here with my friend Jason. Jason, you good today, buddy? I am, man. I'm doing well, and I'm especially, not especially, especially excited about <laughs> our uh, our guest today because growing up in New Orleans, I'm a fan of jazz, and it's someone that happens to to bring a pretty strong jazz game to the table. So I'm excited about uh, about her being with us. No doubt, no doubt. Well, without further ado, let me introduce Ruth Naomi Floyd, an artist, vocalist, and composer. She has created a discography dedicated to a sacred jazz expression, as, as you said, Jason. She's been at the forefront of creating uh, vocal jazz settings that express theology and justice, and she's been doing it for over 25 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, she leads her own multifaceted ensemble, and her recordings consist primarily of original compositions. She's been uh, a presence and a worker in areas of the arts and justice and throughout her career. Uh, all over the place, at in seminaries, universities, conferences, academic settings in the United Kingdom, Europe, Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Um, she's a committed uh, music educator. As a matter of fact, uh, currently the Frederick Douglass Jazz Works is something that her, it's a new body of work that she has uh, created based on the speeches and writings of the great leading orator, abolitionist, writer, publisher, and statement, statesman Frederick Douglas. Miss mm. Floyd continues to make the city of Philadelphia her home, uh, where again for over 25 years she's been devoted and active in providing compassionate care, spiritual support to people infected and affected by HIV and AIDS in the Philadelphia area and Africa. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Miss Ruth Naomi Floyd. How are you doing today, Miss Floyd? I am well, and I'm glad to be in the number, as my great grandmother would say. Oh, I love that! I love that. <laughs> Granny used to say that all the time. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yes, I love it. I love it. Well, listen, uh, we're we're so thankful that that you're here. And as I've you know kind of went through your bio a little bit, you've been at the forefront of creating uh, the, the the beautiful chaos of, if you will, of jazz mm-hmm. that expresses mm-hmm. theology and justice uh, for for a long time, over 25 years. What originally moved you to want to do this work in particular? I have to start with my parents. They were really revolutionaries, and they saw a need in the urban uh, cities of gang warfare back in the 60s and 70s, Mm. and they prayed about it, they preached about it, they talked about it, but then they went to work. And so I grew up surrounded by gunfire and all those things, but had felt so safe. And I think that's our art to be in a place mm. surrounding tragedy and surrounding violence and still to feel safe and at home. So mm. I saw them work and I, you know, worked with them. From that, I really felt called. I think it, it, it called to justice and called to the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. And so for me, I'm an emancipatory artist. And by that, I mean that I am a seeker of beauty. My mm. great great grandmother was an enslaved African in America, African prisoner of the forced labor system of American slavery. Mm. Mm. And because of her height, six foot two, the master made her to be um, dehumanized in every way, an example. And mm. so she became yeah. the mule that pulled the plow. But on her way back from this place of dehumanization and abuse and oppression, She searched for beauty, whether it's a pine cone, a weed, a blade of grass, a stick, a rock, and placed it on the butcher block in her cabin and would say to her children, look, there's beauty here. And so her blood is running warm in my veins. And I think that's where I come for a seeker of beauty, a a follower of beauty that I seek to capture it. But equally is truth-telling. We serve a truth-telling God who speaks it in truth, but also speaks it with justice, who mm-hmm. speaks it with beauty, but also speaks it um, in, a, in a powerful way. So we serve the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. And I think those two together has really helped uh, catapult me to do the work that I've done with in the area of music and jazz and composing and teaching 
but then also with photography and then also with my justice work in HIV and AIDS and in the last 12 years in the transgender communities. And mm -hmm. so I wouldn't want to be one without the other. Um, I'm a teaching artist and, and that keeps me um, authentic because uh, yeah. when I rise up and say, mm -mm. Um, so I'm really <laughs> grateful. So I think that's really what has pushed me. I would say for, in the sense of jazz music, it's been, um, you know, just the stereotypes and the misinformation about black music. Mm -hmm. I think I could listen to you tell a story my whole life. Oh, you're how, very kind. <laughs> how you, how you craft, like, mm. oh my God, man, mm. man, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> uh -huh. Not only, not only, you know, as with photography and like just how you think creatively, you know, through music, things like that, man, just how you put, I'm, I'm there where you are right now. How, how you craft things. I'm, thank you. I mean, golly. <laughs> Well, I'm, he, I'm a fan here. I'm, I'm a fan here. <laughs> okay, we just have to convince Jason. <laughs> I, I was already a fan. So I know, you know, I know. <laughs> so we're we're all good. So yeah. So so I tell you, it, it segue because I, he we didn't even plan that. That was great segue because the art, the way you do articulate things, you've lectured in multiple places, uh, as Derek said in the in the in the bio and. And I wish I could be sitting in on some of them. And if I was brand new, sitting in a lecture with you, and you're talking about beauty, theology, justice, culture, the arts, I'm brand new hearing you for the first time. What do you hope I walk out having heard and act on? What do you really hope I catch from what you're saying? That we can go from deepest despair to unspeakable mm. joy. And that that's a path we go back and forth with in our own lives, in our family life, our church life, in our community, in our nation. We're there right now. Yeah. Um, these moments of sheer beauty in the midst of sadness and death and illness and racism and COVID. And, and that's what I hope you walk away from. And then I'm a blues girl. The blues tell the story of life. Mm. And so it tells what's happening. So you have the enslaved Africans praying, hoping, fighting, trusting for freedom. And freedom comes, Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. And then the harsh reality is that the freedom promise is not delivered. Mm -hmm. so, and so what, does, what do they do? They change their music from the African-American spirituals to the blues. African-American mm -hmm. spirituals are a hope and a promise and a working and a faith and an act of faith in words, deeds, and actions towards freedom, towards liberation. The blues are the reality of this harsh path we call life. And mm -hmm. so you look in the Bible, you have the blues books to the Bible. You have Job, that brother certainly had the blues. Yeah, for you have real. the blues of Naomi. You have the blues of, of David. You have all these blues. And so mm. it's powerful. But then the first and greatest artist, the one who creates out of nothing, becomes the greatest blue singer of all time. And he sings, and I love Ma Rainey, mm. and I love Bessie Smith, but he becomes the blues for us, and he sings the greatest blues line ever written. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mm. So God gives us um, an opportunity and permission in the garden of our blues, just as in Gethsemane, he knew he had to drink the cup. He, in, in the spiritual, he says, I'll go down and die. Prepare me a body, God. I'll go down and die for Derek. I'll go down and die for Jason. But this mm -hmm. is the moment. And I, I'm old. I grew up in the Rambo area. So as a child, I was like, why isn't he doing Rambo? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> go to throw the Roman Empire. And, and I, I really struggled. I felt bad. Like, I didn't like Holy Thursday. I just wanted Jesus to like be Peter, gang warring in the, in the heart, you know? um, And so, but then I had to learn, and life taught me that he says, if this cup could pass, 
he knew it couldn't. But I love that he still asks because he gives mm. the permission to ask. So it became the blues. And in every blues, there's a glimmer of hope. There's a line of hope. There's a hope. And you are telling the truth. So that's a long answer to your question. No. Sorry, but that's what so good. inspires me. That's what pushes me is that we will have tribulation, but we serve the one who's the greatest blues singer. Bessie Smith said, a blues singer never stops singing. Mm -hmm. So the greatest blues singer turns that around. And in Zephaniah, he says, I sang the blues, I became the blues, but now I'm going to sing over my people joyfully. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's radical. And I think we have to really live in that place of the blues to really understand this path we call life and the road following. Have we decided to follow Jesus? Will we pick up that cross and follow him? To do mm -hmm. so, it's a blues experience. And so that's what I love talking about and sharing. I love it. I love it. I lo I love that perspective. I've never in my life have heard it from that like from that viewpoint. And my mind is blown right now, Miss Floyd. My mind is blown. That's it's good. You, know, you have Jeremiah. You have Jeremiah, who's a young boy. Mm. Who, God, I never understood why God didn't just let him go along and keep hoping. Maybe God will change the sermon. But God tells them from the door, you're going to preach the same sermon, same people. They're not going to listen. You're not going to have a family of comfort. And by the Sorry. way, they're going to be trying to assassinate you. And to put it off, they're not going to change. Can you, <laughs> can you imagine Derek preaching the same sermon for 40 years, knowing that the, the congregation's life depended on it, and they do not listen? Yeah. Yeah. And so he's the weeping prophet. Yeah. The, Bible talks about the blues. We shouldn't run away from it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So Man, that's, such, that's such a good perspective. I'm, mm. I'm thankful for that. So let's 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 talk a little bit more. You know, obviously, uh, you've been in Philly now. It's been your your home for for 25 years. Uh, I don't know if you're a basketball fan. I'm sorry that you know. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I waited so long for basketball, and it was so promising. And, and then the management. We, okay, I, it'll happen. It'll happen. Hey, uh, at least you're not a Knicks fan, so there, there's that. I, you under, yeah, I got you. You want, you want to talk about the, talk about the Blues? Yeah. But, uh, I, I digress. Yes. Uh, so, but clearly, you, you, uh, you served there. You've sung there. You've educated people there uh, during those 25 years there in the city, obviously specifically in the area of justice. But you mentioned this, you've, you've, all, you've also, you provided care, spiritual support to those affected by, by HIV and AIDS. With, with all those years of experience, is there one, one story that has deeply impacted you, that, that has changed you or you know, compelled you to keep on going uh, and all the work that you're doing. Yes. Dr. Kenneth C. Larder and I were part of a ministry started out of 10th Presbyterian called Hope at the beginning of HIV and AIDS. So when they were not sure how it was transmitted, and we were called to work with those who are at the end of their journey, uh, death and dying. So this is when there was one funeral home in Philadelphia that would take a corpse. One supermarket that would let someone that's kept carpet sarcoma uh in the you know and uh no hospital one hospital graduate hospital where you had to go to the top floor where nurses and doctors would volunteer shifts to care mm -hmm. so there's a lot of death and dying i would like to be transparent and show one that doesn't show me in a great light but was powerful of the hypocrisy of my own soul and heart we had two clients one was bobby amazing, beautiful man, how he transmitted is just a tragedy. And then we had another man um, named John, who was an atheist. And so it was really hard to minister to him because he didn't want the name of God or Jesus or any spiritual verbiage. So he had to act it out, right? But he was utterly and completely racist. Both of their desire was that they would die a peaceful death and it would go fast. 
And Bobby really wanted that. And his family prayed, Christian, and they prayed. And he had to date. It's the one death that still haunts me. Uh, the doctors left the room and said, uh, let us know when he's gone. It was that bad. Um, it was a long death of the 48 hours. It was tragic. It was terrible. And so I walked home from the University of Pennsylvania to my home in South Philly. And I was angry at God. I was like, he contract is not, you know, it's tragic how he contract, contracted it. And it's tragic anyone that contracts it. It's the one thing he asked for. And he didn't give it to him. Uh. Two days later, it was time for John to, to leave this earth. And I go to death watch with him because his relatives are coming up from the south to be with him. And they didn't make it in time because of the accident. And so he dies while I'm there. The most beautiful death. In fact, after he passed, I was like, that's the way I want to go. I mean, he just <laughs> fell asleep with a smile on his face. Then the sun came out of the clouds. I mean, all I was missing was the Philadelphia Orchestra as a soundtrack. It was mm-hmm. amazing. And so I was happy for him, but I was really angry. And I was so focused on those two different deaths. Like in my own sinfulness, I wanted them switched. Mm. And it wasn't until I realized that for Bobby, yes, it was terrific, but he will never experience pain again. And he'll be the one who created him. For John, it was the last moment in some ways of peace. He would never be able to abide with God. Wow. And so which one would we dis- which one would we want? And so it really I had to restudy and say, God knows what he's doing, God's sovereignty. Mm-hmm. And that's not my job to speak into what he's doing. My job is to do. And so mm-hmm. it was really powerful. Wow. And it radically changed how I gave the gift of mercy and love to patients the rest of the time that I served. And it was mm-hmm. a picture of hypocrisy and sinfulness and I'm and I'm glad the Lord broke me. He yeah. kind of said, oh, boo boo, who are you? It was a little <laughs> oh. was like, And I, I really realized like he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Walk, Bobby will walk through the rivers and I'll never overcome and walk through the fire. And so mm-hmm. it was a beautiful and it's the thing at the end of my life. Yes, I love music, yes, I love photography, yes, I love teaching. Um, but it's the thing is, you know, what it means to love your neighbor and what mm-hmm. does it mean to be a neighbor. And that's the thing that I, I'm so utterly grateful for to serve in a time where Christians weren't having the greatest response to AIDS and, yeah. um, and we yeah. weren't leading the way and being a light. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I appreciate you being transparent and you know, talking about your, your own personal heart, right? Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times it's easy to you know, just kind of brush, brush that stuff through, but I appreciate you being vulnerable. Thank you. Well, continuing on that vein, I mean, I think uh, about the blues and about just the way truth and love and and those things collide. I want to read this to get it right. On social media, you recently described some of the work you've done with British artists, if I remember correctly. I think it was in one of the posts on the work you've done with the British artists as a theology of hope and the blues, truth telling and the seeking and seeking beauty in the midst of resistance and racism. Freedom is the name of the work you collaborated on that focused on Mende Nas. Now, correct me in how I'm saying it, because I'm probably not saying it the right way. So please tell me how to say it correctly. Yeah, you said it correctly, I believe. It's been a while. I hope I'm saying it right. Yeah, Mende Mende Nasr is what I thought. Yes. But, But there you go. So... Some, I'm sure that, that, that including myself, most of our listeners are not aware of that story that up, upon which you based that work, the, that collaborative work, Freedom. Can you talk about that, about that story and about that work? Sure. I was deeply humbled to ask to compose um, music surrounding her story. I named it Freedom. and I. I've studied African-American slavery for decades. And I'm ashamed to say at that point, I was not completely, uh, had a complete understanding of modern day slavery. 
and what mm. was going on in uh, around the other parts of the world, certainly in the UK. And so yeah. hearing a story as a Sudanese woman who was abducted and sold into slavery and then landed in, uh, forced into uh, the UK to serve, um, she was mistreated and it truly is a modern day slavery. She was able to escape, thank goodness, and she was set free. And she's been very bold and courageous because she was the slave of a diplomat, very powerful, mm -hmm. powerful man and family. But she told her story and now she, she's an activist that goes around and tells and, and and along with those that have support her from parliament of getting her story out in this issue. Um, and it's just powerful. She has an amazing book. Uh, and it's it's really, it's shocking in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. The powerful and dense way of what man will do to humankind will do to humankind for greed, mm -hmm. for... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's a powerful story. It was my honor to create it and compose it and then to perform it uh, in Wales. That's good. And, and so for our, for our listeners to have access to hear some of that music, what's the, how would they do that? We have not recorded it yet. I am thinking about recording it. We have a lot of recording to do. We're halfway through Frederick Douglass Jazz Works and then I have another project. And then hopefully that that will appear on my sixth album under my name, but yeah, I'm hoping to. I wanted it to be hauntingly beautiful. I wanted the, the listener to be slightly uncomfortable, but also to have that tension of this beautiful human made in the image of God, who, as Frederick Douglass said, I prayed for 20 years for freedom, but freedom didn't come until I prayed with my feet, my legs. And oh, so mm. she made a way and others weren't able to to do that, and so I want to honor, but I, I definitely create composed in a hauntingly beautiful way. So I don't know it's a it's a composition you'll reach for every time, but it's it's one that um, tells her story truthfully. I hope in the tensions, but in the beauty of that horror. Yeah, yeah, it's one to sit with, right? Like it's not one to just casually listen to. It's good. That's her. That's her. That's not me. It's just her story, and I wanted to. You know, reflect that. Well, you you mentioned him, <clears throat> uh, Frederick Douglass, and uh, the work that you're doing right now, uh, the Frederick Douglass Jazz Works. That's your new body uh, of work, and we know that it's based on his, his speeches and his writings. In reality, we know also that he was a, a great orator, abolitionist, writer, publisher, statesman. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know that about Frederick Douglass. A lot of people probably don't even know who he is. What do we need uh, most to hear today in, in, the, in this current uh, American climate, this, this, uh, this cultural moment, if you will, um, from the great Frederick Douglass? What would you think that we would need to hear right now from him? Derek, there are so many things. I <laughs> encourage everyone. Yes, his life story is amazing. He wrote three bios and, and then Dave Blythe wrote the Pulitzer winning prize book that is just amazing. What I would say, if you really want to know who he is, study his speeches too. Mm. So I think this quote sums it up for where we are right now. And it's a hard quote to hear. Slavery has left behind it a spirit that still delights in human blood. Outrage, murder, and assassination are the inheritance of the freed men and women of the South. Neither our government nor our citizens, civilization, seems able to stop the flow of blood. As in the time of slavery, the church is silent. Mm -hmm. The number one question that Douglas was asked was this by white men. Douglas, are you not afraid of injuring the cause of Christ hmm. in trying to liberate his people? That was the question he was asked most. Hmm. So that quote and that question speaks volumes, and I think it speaks volumes where we are today. Wow. The Church of Silence, whatever, whether you only embrace the sentiment of BLM, 
Black Lives Matter. Whether you embrace fully or partly or aspects or nuances of Black Lives Matter, Inc., the issue is we have to hold a mirror up to our face and say, where was the church? Would there be a need for Black Lives Matter if the church was doing its job? Mm. So it's one thing to criticize. It's one thing to not want to deal with the nuances. It's one thing to attack or embrace or protest against either of those, the statement or ink. But the root question is, if we were doing our job as Christians in America, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There, would be not, there would not be a need for Black Lives Matter. My and goodness. that's what's missing. And as long as we keep talking about the fruit, which that statement and the ink is that movement. Mm-hmm. It's good things come out of it. But the root is, is that we did not do our job. And Frederick is saying to us, you didn't do your job during this time. Mm-hmm. What kind of theology says to enslave? How can you change the catechism, the theology to change it so that it makes you feel more comfortable owning a, a black body? Well, what does it have to take for you to right. do that? What compromises do you have to make? And I would say in the same way we as Christians, we have made compromises. So it's given room for. My goodness. Things. My goodness. Wow. So I think that's what Frederick would say. Didn't I tell you? And all these things, the church is silent. You mean after all these, all this time after I'm gone? You're still dealing with this? Yeah, I think you would be in some ways very proud and very happy, but I'm studying them for eight and a half years. And this is not like Wikipedia. This is going to Schomburg. This is going to London. This is going everywhere I went. I would stay an extra day or two and study. This is talking to yeah. scholars. This is you know eight and a half years of aggressive work, scholarship. And I think a large part of Frederick would be disappointed, shocked, and enraged, and mournful. Man, I would agree with you. I would agree. Um, you know, it's one of those things where, I don't know, I'm, I'm blown away that we, we as the church, the, the children of God, if you will, uh, still can't seem to get this right. Yeah. Um, the, the amount of... Uh, arguing and bickering that I see on social media, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And then when I deal with people, you know, who who would say that they have no relationship with Jesus, that they're not walking with Jesus, their response to me a lot of times, like, why would I want to be a part of that? When you guys can't even, your your hand's not even in these issues. What's going on? That's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And the world is longing to see so for whatever reason, for whatever motivation, for the most part, the churches say we, we're sorry, maybe repent, lament, which there's a profound misunderstanding of the theology of lament. Uh, I would agree. I think what is missing is that, is that we feel that lament means to sit and to cry with Derek as he pours out his heart of what it means to be a African-American human being, male, in America. So, Jason, you would go. You love Derek. He's your brother. You would go and sit with him and cry with him. And I think that's what Christians think lament is. That's certainly part of it. But lament, for Jason to look in the mirror like I did with Bobby and John and say, oh, here's where mm-hmm. I Maybe mm. I didn't directly fail Derek, but in some ways, even indirectly, I have. And more importantly, I failed God. Let me lament over my own sin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when that's not there, when that doesn't happen, and I'm going to be very frank, this has been my experience, and I've taught K through 12, 12th grade for collective 20 years and university level for 14. What happens is the tears, and I'll be really blunt, the white tears that sit with me on Friday 
depending what happens over the weekend, can then usually turn around and are weaponized against me on Monday. Mm -hmm. So that's why we necessarily have to, that's why it's important to understand lament. Yes, tears, but without that direct of holding the mirror up to ourselves or allowing the Holy Spirit, more important, to hold the mirror up to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can have the tears, which mean them, which are powerful and it's meaningful on, on Friday, but if something happens and changes, you can hide behind weaponizing those white yeah. on Monday. And so um, that's that's what I mean. There's not the sense of lament. And then there's not a time of of corporate lament, of a community lament. And right. then you go on to confession and you go on to repentance. But here's what the world needs to see all of that. Absolutely. Yeah. But this is what I believe, having been a world of you, having been traveled for 25 years, almost on every coast, the world needs to see restorative justice. And there's no mm -hmm. that looks. We can talk about reparations. We can talk about many things, right? It's longing to see restorative justice from the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. That stops. In almost every other sin, it's not a question. It's right. not a question. Right. Of restoration but when it comes to racism there's and then you have to again go to the root and the root gives indications of why that is mm -hmm. in, in Christianity. So. at the risk of what i'm about to say sounding contradictory at first because it's not so i hope you'll hear it fully i want to clarify as a white skin brother i want to clarify something the church wasn't silent the white church was. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. You feel me? Like like Frederick Douglass is just as much a leader in the church. Mm -hmm. He wasn't silent, right? Like you're you're a leader. You're a leader in the church. You're not silent. MLK was a leader. C. T. Vivian, John Perkins, John L like we could keep going down the line. Harriet Tubman and and, and we interviewed uh, somebody recently on another episode who even told us about a white woman who is a great granddaughter to a Confederate general who in Montgomery was not silent uh -huh. and preceded Rosa Parks. Like, in other words, almost set the stage for her to have the courage to do what she did. Right. Like and, and this, by the way, is a, it was a brown skinned brother telling us the story. He's a very educated uh, pastor here in town. And and and. And I'm just thinking, man, the the white church is who's silent. Like well, that that's what we need to hear. Right? But but even saying that the church is silent in a white dominated America, right, is a fine statement to make because we typically think of it as the white church, but the church wasn't silent, was it? But a lot of the white church didn't listen. Right. And, and when you talk about why, why didn't they listen? And then, you know, as my grandfather would say, follow the money. There you go. There usually lies the answers. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it's so much about what, what am I willing to let go of? What do I think I have to hold on to? Right. And that, that's what's at the heart of that, right? Like it, when you really get down to it, it's the I don't really trust God for daily bread. And I don't really think, you know, that another human is worth dying for. And I don't really want to talk about forgiveness because I don't even know how to forgive myself for the things I'm ashamed of. And I don't want to like I just I can go through the litany and the liturgy of the of the Lord's Prayer and come up with multiple things I should be lamenting for mm -hmm. and repenting of and growing. And and you're so right. So my my point in, in uh, what I hope did not sound contradictory at all about wow. Ruth is it, my point is to affirm that as a white skin brother and say Hey, um, yes, like, please, let's wake up to this need of lament. Let's wake up to the beauty of what the blues and what hope mean together. Let's wake up to how I can, I don't just need to empathize and feel in the sense of what you feel, but I need to even let that in passion move me to compassion, right? right? And, and to take action. And, and, and so thank you. I just want to say thank you for, unpacking that because i think for 
especially for white listeners, uh, white-skinned listeners, which I love what Dr. Lucretia Berry told us. Yeah. Her four-year-old daughter calls says that white people are just white-brown. <laughs> like we're just a lighter brown that we're all hues of brown which I, I i told her i loved that resonated with me i don't know if it resonated with anybody else but but the but i say that to say i hope our listeners who are white-skinned can hear with humility what you just said and yeah. thank you thank you for saying it seriously um, i think it's real important to look at language too there's the word complicit mm-hmm. a lot when you think of the foundations of America, it was about white superiority. So it was creators, co-creators. That's the difference between complicit, being complicit, mm-hmm. or creating that environment or creating the DNA of yeah. the situation. And then I want to say, as you brought up, Jason, that there are white allies and then there's the white accomplices. And I would say right now we need white accomplices. Mm. Example of white accomplices, John Brown and his sons. Mm. They come out right before they execute him. Like, come on, John. Like, okay, we'll just put you in prison and we'll let you out. You're white, but come on. You're really going to die? And he said, no. He and his sons executed for that. After that, a warrant issued for Frederick Douglass arrested. He then goes to the UK, escapes to the UK. But we need white accomplices. Accomplices, um, and we need white allies too. But we need white ally can always go back, can always yeah. walk away. Sure. White accomplice can. And so, am I making this like where's the spirituality in that? It's it's in the deep theology of loving your neighbor. That's yes, good. that's good. Yes, and I want to be honest. I said to my friend the other day, I can always tell when a white leader is not serious about talking about racism. My experience is they teach the theology of loving their neighbor, but when do they teach it? When we need to hear about the sin of racism. So the sermon needs to be the sin of racism. Instead, we get who's our neighbor and how we love. I love Mr. Rogers, but right now we need both. Yeah. Center of what's going on. That's not being married to culture. That's not putting down the Bible. That's not being Marxist. That's not being a black It's deep in the theology of what your neighbor is, that you're willing to risk, that you're you're willing to to give up everything for yeah. your neighbor. And so that is the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. But yeah. that's left out. I can always tell because then instead of the that theology, it's like, who's our neighbor? Well, everyone and then I mm-hmm. think He's got the whole world in his hands, or we are the world. You know? <laughs> well, and, and I mean, again, amen. Like, 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 here's what bothers me is we, how could you even teach the Good Samaritan story without talking about racism? Mm-hmm. How can you even teach the, what, it, when someone poses the question to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Mm-hmm. And he tells them the story of blatant racism. Yes. Yes. And like preach racism when you're willing to embrace certain other cultural things that are that break your heart, that bring you to your knees on the floor, but you're not willing to do the same for this issue. That's yeah. right. The hypocrisy. I will preach from the pulpit about these issues, but when it comes to racism, oh wait a minute, we can't let culture, we can't let the world dictate to us, we can't. Wait a minute, you're able, no problem to deal with the nuances of this cultural issue. But when mm-hmm. it comes to racism, all of a sudden, you know, be not conformed to the world is <laughs> a million times. You know. you oh, it. man. I love it. <laughs> I love it. You, you've, hit, you've hit every nail on the head. Everything that you've said is pure facts. It's so good. Well, I, I don't want this time to end, but I also want you to get to your fish. So I'll 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 throw out the last. I'll throw I'll throw out, I hope you have some remoulade sauce or something with your fish that you could dip them in now, all right? That's my New Orleans. I made my own sauce. So. There you go, there you go. That's my New Orleans. Well, it's yeah. 
I'm my great great grandmother's daughter, so I better know how to burn in the kitchen. Got to cook. Got to do it. <laughs> so I'll get a certain Derek. I'll get certain cards taken from me. <laughs> <laughs> all all facts again. <laughs> So good. Well, so let, let, we'll close with this. You, you've blessed us deeply, and I appreciate it. it. This collision of theology and justice, this collision of the blues and hope, this collision of, of love and good works, this collision of faith that leads to action. In that collision, some people are listening and they're taking next steps. They're taking new steps. What what do you encourage them with? I think first and foremost to really take time to really study the God of history. Mm. He redeems it every single time. So to be truth telling about history doesn't mean to live there and to make it mm -hmm. an idol and to be handcuffed to it. It means to understand to be part of the redeeming work of the Holy Spirit, the redeeming work of Christ and his cross, to be part mm. of the actions. Sometimes that means, as my my dear friend, um, Dr. John Nunes says, is to be inside the institution and to work within there. I'm a different kind of person. So sometimes it means outside. I'm more of an outside person. Like, <laughs> um, So it, it means to... But it means that all of us have a place. And I talk about this like the art of protest. I start off with, like I had a theologian said, I don't believe in protest. I don't, he was African-American, just so you know. Yeah, I don't believe in protest. I don't believe in all this. I don't believe in that. And I said, you don't. He goes, no, no, it's not biblical. I said, okay. I was like, and we talked about other things. And I said, by the way, what, what denomination are you? Protestant. I was like, okay. And I was like, wait a minute. What did you say? Protestant. I was like, okay. I said, just say it one more time. He said, Ruth, you're not hard of hearing. I said, Say the word slowly. And then he was like, <laughs> what does Protestant mean? Mm -hmm. So here we go. He already has been, his mind, I talked with him further so I could say this, has been colonized to say like, that protest is great. Mm -hmm. This protest isn't. Mm -hmm. So what are the differences between those protests? Um, you know, when we think about even with the rioting, we have to look at the history of where we learned the art of rioting. You know, sometimes that rioting and all stuff is called a tea party. And then other times it's called, you know, black thugs. You know, mm -hmm. we have to talk about the ethics of taking versus stealing. Mm -hmm. We have to look and see um, all these things. And that means to take time and, and to not allow others to, 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 have you embrace uh, words and ide ideologies without learning it. History is one way you can do it. Theo theologically is the way, but history certainly is a tool. And I'm just so frustrated now that to even think about history or say it, you're viewed as a Marxist, which is then God must be one because he spends time spelling it out. What is Matthew one? What is he doing? And be God, yeah. and be God, and be God. That's yeah. history. So we're not yeah history on an uh, altar, we're not mm -hmm. abiding by it and being totally committed to it, that that directs our past, but we have to deal with the nuances. So I would say, do the hard work of the tension. I mean, that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I love Baldwin. He never really let it go, even though he warred against his Christianity, and even though he war against it and battled mm -hmm. against it, he never let it go. So do the hard work of that tension, being present in the tension, and then sit and listen. Yeah. And listen. And then I would say, do a long study of Hebrews. The theology of hope. Uh, yeah. Hope in Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one who can see further down the road than we can. The yeah. one who fully understands what it means to hope in God, to hope against hope, to press yeah. against hope. So that's what I would say. I could go on and on. But that's I love what it. I say, is live in the tension, be present in the tension, and listen and learn, and do your own work, you know. That's so I am not. I am not justifying any of the actions I gave as examples. I'm merely pointing out the hypocrisy of how some of those actions, when do, viewed by different communities, are yeah. glorified, and when other, you know, so.
Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. I, you didn't have to give that caveat, but we appreciate it anyway. Yeah, yeah. And before Derek wraps us up, I, I texted you ahead of time asking yes. you if you were okay. But yes. would you mind if you I'd take a drink of water? And would you mind what, whatever you want to do, whether it's from the Frederick Doug, Douglass works or whatever? Because since we've obviously given him a lot of honor on this, mm-hmm. um, but give us a quick excerpt before you head to to, to munch on some good fish there. Sure. Frederick Douglass, in his speech in 1865, was titled What the Black Man Wants. I'm not sure, Jason and Derek, that a black man could give that speech today. Hmm. But he did in 1865. And it was simply about endurance. And so Hmm. the Frederick Douglass jazz works are filled with only his words. Every lyric I sing, words. Of Frederick Douglass. So this is um, what inspired me to write the music and assemble the lyrics together of Press On. People are now in tears. There is mourning in the streets. We feel Tears are falling by the fires. We see blood flowing all around, far reaching, overwhelming judgments are terrible but we need to fight for us just next Powerful. My goodness. My goodness. If Thank that you. wasn't the, the cherry on top, I appreciate that, Ms. Ford. Press on. He's a Christian. He was a theologian. He's a minister. He's a preacher. He's telling us we cannot fail. We cannot afford to get this right now. Press on. Well, we will, we will, and we hope our listeners will as well, because yeah. obviously this work, as we were talking off off camera, uh, the long hard work of reconciliation, uh, it's it's hard, um, but it's worth it. So we definitely do need to continue to press on. We appreciate that, well, Miss Miss Floyd. How uh, how do we go about following you? We know that you're on you're on social media. Are you on Twitter and Instagram, or, or just yeah. and, uh, and and Facebook, and your your handle is at RN Floyd, correct? Instagram, and then for Twitter, I think it's Ruth and Amy Floyd. And then okay. for, uh, for Facebook, it's Ruth and Amy Floyd. I have a Frederick Douglass Jazzworks page that I would love people to hear. Each We have Fridays with Frederick, and I post something, a little bit of information about him each week, a quote 
or something interesting about him. So I'd love for you on Facebook to follow that. And then I have a photography and music page and then my personal page. So, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, we thank you so much for your time. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. And, uh, and for our listeners, we thank you for, for tuning in again as we continue the conversation with the Reconciliation Conversation. We'll catch you next time. Thank you for joining in on the Reconciliation Conversation. Remember, you can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Recon Combo. You can also stay connected with us through our website, reconciliationconversation.com, or feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel under No More Night Media. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you next time.